Welcome to Angling Times Video Zine, a new concept in angling instruction and entertainment. We hope you'll enjoy our whistle stop guide to the wonderful world of fishing. Hi, I'm Matt Hayes. And hi, I'm Bob Roberts. Welcome to a new concept in angling videos. We've got some great action over the next hour with some of the sport's top stars, including Rob Malin, Tom Pickering, Kevin Maddox and Neville Fickley. And we've got some great fish sequences with carp, pike and barbel. But first of all, let's get off to the River Trent and have a look at the art of stick float fishing. Here I am on the River Trent at Long Higgin. This is the old member stretch, which is a day ticket stretch, and I'm joined by an old mate, Tom Pickering. What are you going to show us today, Tom? Hello, Bob. I'm going to talk about the basics of stick float fishing. It's a method that catches a tremendous amount of fish. It doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, you've got to keep it as simple as possible to catch more fish. All right then, Tom. But before we start, let's have a look at the tackle you're going to use. Right, Bob. Let's start with the tackle. First of all, let's start with the rod. There's two types of rod on the market. One is a splice tip, one is a hollow glass tip. I prefer for stick float fishing a splice tip. As you can see, all the action is in the top quarter of the rod. Because when you stick float fishing, the line's on the surface, and I want to pick that line up very quickly to the stick float. So I need a quick action rod, so I can pick it up and clunk straight into the fish. That's why I prefer a stick float, a splice tip rod for stick float fishing. Thank you, Tom. I notice you're using a close face reel. These are becoming less fashionable now with a lot of anglers on the trend using an open face reel. Why are you using a closed face? There's two types of reel on the market. One is an open face, one is a closed face. I prefer closed face simply because I can get the reel quite close to the body because I like to feed the line to the stick float. With a closed face reel I can do that. I can get the reel quite close and just feed the line to the stick float and I know that then that the stick float's going down at the correct pace in the swim. Whereas if you had an open face reel like so, I find that the line comes off too fast because it's too open and I find I can't control the float the same and that's why I don't like that for stick float fishing. Waggler fishing, perfect. Stick float fishing, always a close face reel. What about lines for stick float fishing, Tom? Can you give us some guidance? Obviously with stick float fishing you need a nice floating line on the surface. I use Harrier line at two pound breaking strain and I find that works very, very well for stick float fishing. Lies on the surface, perfect. Right then, Tom. Before we go any further, let's look back to this morning and will you explain to me how you made your float choice for this particular peg? There's four styles of stick floats which I use. The bottoms of the stick floats are quite important because I have aluminium and I have lignum. The lignum is for distance work, the aluminium is for close work. I prefer them two styles. But the tips are probably the most important. I have a pointed tip and I have a dome tip. I use pointed tips for running the float through and I use dome tips for slowing the bait down and holding it back a little bit. So when you put them all together, I've got a lignum dome, I've got a lignum pointed, I've got an aluminium dome and I've got an aluminium pointed. And them's the only four styles that I use. So for close work it's the aluminium, for lignum it's distance work. That seems very simple Tom. So what have you chose to use today? Well I've looked at the swim and it's about 10 foot deep and it's quite pacey and I'll be fishing it quite close in so I'm going to use the aluminium for close work and I'm going to use a dome top so I can slow the bait down a little bit and hold back and hopefully put the bait into the fish's mouth so obviously I've gone for an aluminium and a dome top shaped float. To fix the float on the line what we use is a top and bottom rig and we use two rubbers, two tight rubbers, one on the top of the float which needs to be about quarter of an inch down from the tip. You don't want it halfway down the float, about, about quarter of an inch from the tip so that the line comes off very very free because if it's down the body of the float when you strike you, you splash the water and scare the fish. And on the bottom you want a half an inch piece of silicone tubing so that the float goes on halfway and you've got a little bit overlapping so that the shot that you put underneath the float actually nestles into the silicone rubber and that's how you fix it on the line. You said the river here was about 10 feet deep, Tom. How did you know that? 
I think that plumbing the depth is one of the most important things about angling. I think that most of the fish feed near the bottom and you need to know that your bait is on the bottom. So obviously first of all you look at the swim, you think what kind of depth it is and you set your float at that. At that. Then you put your plummet on the end of the line. I use quite a heavy plummet so I know that it's definitely on the bottom. Then what you do, you cast it out into the swim where you're fishing, lowering it down to a tight line. If the float goes under, obviously you haven't got the correct depth, you have to put a little bit more depth on. If the float's above the surface, you could take a little bit depth off until you actually get it spot on, level with the surface. Then what you do, you actually run the float through and if it drags the bottom, you take the depth off an inch at a time till your float runs through perfectly without dragging under. Then you know you've got your bait on the bottom, bounce along the bottom, that's where the feeding fish are. Well I'm sure that will help a lot of anglers. Can you let us just have a quick look at your shotting pattern and then let's catch some fish. On the terminal tattle and shotting patterns, first of all going from the bottom, I use a size 22 hook uh, to a pound bottom. When it gets hard I'll change to a 24, maybe a 12 ounce bottom. And then the terminal shotting pattern is roughly 9 or 10 inches above the hook, I have a number 10. Then 9 inches above that I have a number 8. And then at regular intervals, about every 9 inch, I have number 6's. And that's what we call shirt button style, they're all regular intervals. And that, all them shotting shots want to be in roughly the bottom two thirds of the swim. Therefore, the float won't sit up straight away when you cast in. Underneath the float, I have a number 8 or 10 shot, just a tiny little shot. I don't want a big shot underneath the float because I don't want the float to sit up. I want it to drop through the water as the shot cock the float, like so. And that's a straightforward shotting pattern, what we call shirt button style. Right, we're all set up now. We've got the right rod, the right reel, the right line, the right stick float, correct shotting pattern, all going to nice catch some fish. Right. Because this swim's running from left to right, it's always important that you have your hook length landing downstream of your, your stick float. So what you do, moving from the left, you swing it, swing it round, and the, float, the hook then will automatically go around past the float and land in a straight line downstream. That way your line then is at the back of your stick float and if you keep it in a straight line at the back of the stick float, your stick float should cock to the shotting pattern and go through the swim absolutely perfect. If the line does move off line a little bit, all you do is lift the rod to the float and just lay it at the back of the float because then your float's going through perfect. When you hook a big fish, keep your rod tipped towards the water just take your time, there's no rush, and just make the fish swim against the flow, bringing it upstream till you get the fish in front of you. When you get your fish in front of you, you're not fighting it down the swim, come to the surface, play the fish on top, use the rod tip, and when you think it's ready for the net, just pick your net up, slide it out, slide the fish over the net, and lift. Put your rod down, put landing net behind you. I always put my landing net on the top of the keep net like so, grab the fish, Unhook it gently and place the fish in the keep net. Lovely fishing. Well, thank you very much, Tom. This has been both a pleasure and an education. Do you think we could have a look at your fish before we go? I'd like to take this opportunity of showing the viewers the correct way of returning the fish into the swim. What you do, you get the keep net from the bottom, get the bottom ring, and lift the net up like so, so that the fish are actually swimming up the keep net in the water. Let them swim naturally to the top of the net like so. Don't bounce it on the bank. And when you get them to the top of the net like so, you can lift them, have a look at what you've caught. There's about five pound of nice roach there, and just put them back into the water and they'll swim away naturally. And they're unarmed and they'll, go, they'll come back to fight another day. Well thanks Bob and now that that's so crystal clear I'll look forward to seeing you in the next England team. I don't think so Matty, not now Gazza's fit. Hmm, <laughs> anyway on to more familiar territory now, well for me anyway, carp fishing. You know I know more guys who are besotted with carp fishing than any other part of the sport and one of them is Rob Maiden. In this next sequence, Rob takes us to Harefield Lake and removes the mystique surrounding rigs and tackle and catches a lump to boot. Catches mumps? No, not mumps, lump. 
Carp's beak, Bob, for a big fish. Oh, I see, Matt. Come on, let's go and see him. OK. <laughs> now, I thought today I'd show you some of the rigs that I've been using during this trip. This is the rig I've caught the majority of my fish on. It's a pop-up version of the swimmer rig. Um, I've tied it onto 25 pound Chryston silk worm. The counterbalance is made by pushing a small piece of lead wire into some silicon tube. This then can be adjusted to slide up and down the line to alter the height that you fish the pop-up off the bottom. Size 6 Drennan Super Specialist and a quarter of an inch loop pulled through the eye of the hook. The pop-up is then tied on using a sliding slip knot with dental floss. I'll show you how I tie the boilie on. Right, take the dental floss, make a large loop, then a small loop, tuck one in through twice, and tighten the small loop down onto the line. Then just simply slide the knot down onto the boilie and tighten it up. And finish it off just with an overhand knot. This bait can now be tied onto the small loop that you've pulled through the eye of the hook, thus completing the swimmer rig. The multi-bait rig. A very popular rig in the Colm Valley at the moment, a string of three or four baits which imitates a PVA stringer. This time, however, there is a hook there waiting for them. Finally, rig number three is the weighted drop hook. The main difference with this rig as opposed to any other variation of the hair rig, is that the hair and the main line both come out the back of the hook. With all other conventional hair rig types, the hair goes up the shank. Whether it be coming through the eye, off the bend or off the shank, all the hairs point this way. With this rig, it points the other way. The hair comes straight out the back of the hook. Now, for counterbalancing the pop-up, the lead putty, uh, in this case it's Christ on heavy metal, is pushed onto the hook itself, so that when the bait sits upright in the water, the hook hangs down, the hook hangs down like a claw. Now, when the carp comes along and sucks it up, the very light pop-up swirls around inside the mouth, but the heavy weighted hook always hangs down in the bottom of the mouth. And if it tries to eject it, it tends to drag like a claw along the bottom of the mouth on its way out, always catching along the floor of the mouth or just over the rim of the lips on its way out. It's a very effective rig that's been little used up to now. Finally, with safety in mind, I'll tell you about the uh, semi-fixed leads that I use and the method that I use to attach them. Permanently fixed leads are banned on Harefield. I'm using the four ounce lead, a tulip bead, a piece of two millimetre diameter tubing. The tulip bead is pushed through the eye of the swivel. Two millimetre diameter tubing straight over the top. Now, pass your main line through the tubing and tie on the rig and then just pull the whole lot back into the tubing. The large spigoted end of the tulip bead 
fits the swivel snugly, but should you have a crack off and leave a rig in the lake, this can pull out and free itself. Therefore, you're not permanently leaving a lead attached to the fish, tethered up, which could cause it damage to its mouth. Safety in mind, you've got to think of the carp's future. Well, there they are, the three rigs that I've been using. By putting them in the margins like that, you can get some idea of what they look like when presented correctly on the bottom. Very effective, obviously. We've had a right result. It's a fish that I've picked up on top of one of those shallow bars I was just showing you. Now, it's very weedy out there and also very snaggy. And I lost a very big fish here yesterday. Right, it's kiting down behind the bar that runs off the island with the turns nest on it. Doesn't feel a really big fish. There were some lumps up here earlier, so I wouldn't be surprised. No, I don't think it's a big fish. It's going well, though. Very well. I'd actually found a little hump on the bar. It's directly in front of me. It came up with about 18 inches of water. I've got the bait popped up off the top. about 10 inches, so it was right in front of its nose, it couldn't miss it. A little orange pop-up. <sighs> oh yeah. Going now a bit under the tip. Just keep the pressure on it steady. There's a big weed bed close into me here. Get his head down in that. Don't really want it to do that. Oh, 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 he didn't like that. <sighs> Stuart's just signified it's a lump by going, ooh. And that's made matters even worse now. <laughs> do though. Oh dear. Another common. A lot of weed round its head. Come that weed bed close in. Going well under the tip. Oh, flicking off the dorsal there, I hate that. Always take your picture. Oh. All in.
Well, Rob certainly had a result there. A result, Matt? You make this sound more like a football match than fishing. That's more street cred, Bob. It's carp speak for a successful session. Anyway, I'm sure you'll agree that Rob makes it look very simple. And if you follow a few basic rules, it really is. Let's have a closer look at those rigs. OK, so at the top of the screen, you can see the dummy PVA stringer rig. In the middle, you can see the weighted hook rig. And at the bottom, the swimmer rig. So, there you have it. Go out and catch a whacker. A whacker, Matt? Shut up, Roberts. Listen, I want to take you back to the close season now. In between sitting around twiddling my thumbs last May, I went down to the Grey Twos and watched an electrofishing experiment. What I want to know is, why can't it be this simple when the season's open? The NRA now takes to the water, having placed a mild electrical current into the water. This current doesn't permanently damage the fish, it temporarily stuns them and they float up to the surface. They then have to work very quickly indeed to net the fish as they hit the surface and in this case prevent them from spilling over the weir and linear losing their precious stocks of barbel, chub, roach, dace, grayling and pike. As you can see, the fish are scooped out using nets. And the purpose behind this netting experiment was to remove eggs from spawning barbel, rear the fish at the NRA's laboratories in Brampton before returning younger barbel to the river to carry on a successful stocking program. And here's the reason for doing it. A number of immature barbel being returned to the river, fish probably 4 to 12 ounces in weight to ensure a future healthy population. Here's the team working at Havisham Weir, home of Big Barbel, Chub, Dace and Grayling. And look at these for fish. It took me three years to catch a double-figure barbel from this stretch and they've done it in ten minutes, but that's fishing. I have to say as an angler that I wouldn't be prepared to treat fish like this myself. You know, the barbel was stocked into the river here at Havisham in 1975. In 76 there were two weirs constructed and they are very much a captive audience. Interesting stuff. Now then, Matty. Much as I hate to admit this, I know you've had one or two of those fish out of that stretch. So how's about showing us how you fluke them out? Fluke? It's no fluke, Bob. It's all down to pure skill. Anyway, listen. Come on, I'll show you. There are a number of baits you can use for barbel fishing, and the key ingredient in a summer campaign is hemp seed. Luncheon meat, a good bait to fish over the top of the hemp. This bait has been coloured and dyed. Lobworms, a great bait in either clear water or coloured. I keep mine lively by keeping them in a mixture of damp moss and damp newspaper. Sweet corn, an excellent particle bait when the barbel have become tired of meat and cheese. Casters, the matchman's favourite, and another great particle bait for barbel. They love them. Depositing hemp and particles into the swim can be achieved with a bait dropper. Fill the dropper up, not too full, close the lid and cast it out into the swim. When the dropper hits the riverbed, it springs open and the hemp seeds deposited in a nice carpet. Cast the dropper out gently, an easy lob, and allow the dropper to settle on the riverbed before retrieving. Tackle for barbel fishing has one primary requirement, it must be strong. This is my basic straightforward barbel fishing rig. A simple sliding link ledger which is attached to a lighter length of line in case the tackle becomes snagged. That's an eight pound main line with a four pound link sleeved off with silicon rubber and force one shot for casting weight. You can see that a bead acts as a buffer before a swivel which connects the hook link. The silicon rubber you see on the hook link prevents tangles. This is a multi-strand hook link, 
for fish that have become wary and shy of nylon. About 18 inches long, it terminates in a number six hook. And here's a little refinement that you may not have seen before. Attached to the back of that hook is a piece of cork. That makes the bait more buoyant. Wary barbel often have a habit of hoovering up hemp seed, but not picking up hook baits. Took a ledged lobworm over a bed of hemp. He's just shooting under the raft. It's a good fish. Got to try and get him out of that rubbish. Stop him getting under the, under the weed. Oh, he's in it. Just seen he was just shot under the tree. Oh, this is where you need strong gear. He's right in the rubbish. If I can just steer him upstream. There he is. I'll try and get him through that. I've got him through now. It's a decent fish. I've got to hold him away from the snags. Try and net the fish. I'm going to have to get wet here. Don't really want to do this, but... Oh, got soaking wet feet. There it is, just under the surface now. Got a load of weed around him. Just going for the near bank for the rushes. Got to hold the fish over hard. Oh, it's so strong. Oh, there it is. Ooh, I'm just. Got... Into the weed again. Just a pile of pressure on now. Kick the fish out of there. Still not beaten yet. Mustn't panic with the net here. Fish has got to be right over the net before I can actually net it properly. There it is. Yes! Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Oh. That's a good barbel. Right, let's try and sort this lot out. There's the hook. There it is. Still well in. Look, Got all this stuff up the line. That, that's why I use multi uh, Dacron hook links because, unlike nylon, which will fray on this sort of weed, the Dacron will actually cut through it and withstand the pressure. You can see there, that's Kristen Multistrand. It's not damaged at all. But that's a lovely fish. That's what we came here to get. A great ooze barbel. I'm probably going to weigh this one. I think that's five and a half, six pounds. It's an immaculate specimen. These big pink pectoral fins. Quite often the only thing you'll see of a barbel in shallow water are these pectorals. When you're looking at a gravelly bottom, you'll suddenly catch a, a flash of pink, make out the pectoral, and all of a sudden, the shape of the fish materialises. But there's a lesson to learn here, that uh, this fish was in a swim that I knew held barbel. I didn't bother fishing until I'd found the fish. And uh, that's the reward of beauty. Six pounds, six ounces. Magic. And this is the result of a particularly successful summer campaign. An 11 pound 14 ounce great ooze barbel. Sheer perfection. What a beautiful fish. And when you've caught a fish like that, you want to make sure that it goes back in the condition that you caught it. Return the barbel very gently with its head upstream facing the current so that the oxygen can work through the gill rakers. Don't let the barbel go until you're absolutely sure that its strength has returned and it's ready to swim away into the current. You can see me here holding the fish with its head upstream. It wants to kick away, but I'm just making sure that the fish is ready to go. If you don't do this, the result can be a barbel that turns belly up in the middle of the river and I'd have no hesitation in going in after a fish in that condition. To avoid a soaking, do it right first time. 
And this must be the ultimate moment of pride, watching a double-figure fish regain its strength in the current after a great fight and swim away to fight another day. Not bad, Matty. Not bad. I'm not so sure now some of my barber weren't good, Jim. Listen, Bob, I'll tell you, unless you've had one of those big whiskers giving you the runaround, you haven't lived. Anyway, that's enough about me. I've heard it said that you're a bit of a ground bait expert, Bob. Problem is, it was your mother that told me that, and I don't trust that woman anyway, but is there any truth in this vicious rumour? Absolutely. You mean it is a vicious rumour? Probably. Anyway, Matt, come and watch me. It's easy for anyone walking into a tackle shop today to be confused by the vast range of continental ground baits. I'm going to look at some of the ground baits in the range from Marcel van der Nijn and try and sort a bit of this confusion out for you. Before us here are a selection of ground baits and by no means the entire selection from that company and a few of the additives that are made. To make progress on understanding these ground baits you need to understand the properties of each. If you take this bag, Secret, it is perhaps the heaviest ground bait in the, in the selection that we have here. Conversely, this bag, Special, is the lightest. It will be very difficult to mix Special up on its own and actually throw it by hand any more than about six yards. This is Super Cup. And this is a very sweet mix. It's a good base mix, a middle range mix. This is Castar, and this is quite heavy, but because of some of the constituents in it, it's active for a long time. These ground baits aren't made from bread. There is a bread content in there, but they're mainly made from powdered cereals and clays, and also there are bird seeds, um, even bird droppings and various other secret ingredients. Now, if you riddle off castor, you will find that there are some very large pieces in there. Now, when you mix ground bait up in your ground bait bowl, they don't actually absorb water at that time, and so they go into the ground bait and they go into the water as very hard lumps. And it's only when that ground bait has been in the water for quite some while that that ground bait actually starts to work. The fish won't eat those hard bits until they've softened in the water. So just taking that top range there, if you're going to fish a canal and use castor, an ideal mix would be special, which would give a cloud, and secret, which would enable you to throw the ground bait and also take it to the bottom. If you're fishing maggot and you're going to catch small fish, which in generally small fish like sweet baits, you could mix super cup and special because that's a light mix, that's a middle mix and it would give you the opportunity to throw it but it would give a sweet cloud. If you were to add castor to that mix that would allow you to fit fish that mix in fairly deep water because being heavier than these two it would pull the ground bait down to the bottom. Moving on to this next line we have Bob Nudd's active feeder mix. I use this a lot on still waters, particularly where there are carp or big bream. You don't have to add anything to that, you just mix it up fairly dry for the feeder or you mix it up a little bit sloppier if you're going to put it in in balls. Very good mix that one. Similarly, if you're moving on to a river and going to use a ground bait feeder, then the river ace mix here will work perfectly well on its own. It's a smashing ground bait, that, for using on rivers like the Trent or the Severn or even the Thames, wherever you want a quite stiff mix to contain a lot of bait. Now, beet is another good still water ground bait. It's particularly effective where there are bream. Now, when we start talking about ground bait mixes for bream, there are two kinds of bream for most people. There are skimmer bream, which are small bream up to perhaps a pound and a half, and then there are proper bream. They're the same species, but they tend to have slightly different habits. The smaller skimmer bream tend to go for a sweeter mix. So, going back onto here, if I was after skimmer bream, I would be looking at a sweet mix, such as Super Cup. But, to this, 
I would add one of the additives that we see at the bottom here. Brasm is the perfect complement to Super Cup. If we were after catching bigger bream, then the ground bait I would choose would be beet. This can be mixed 50-50 with brown crumb and have good effect. But always bearing in mind that if there were smaller fish moving in on the peg, I would add brasm to the mix to sweeten it up. In some situations, we want to put a lot of bait in, but we don't want to use much ground bait. I can think of situations where you want to use a lot of hemp and castor, and it's very windy. Say you've got a headwind and you cannot catapult your bait as far as you, you want to go, and you're going to have to use some ground bait. The perfect mix for that situation is a combination of world champion and grilled hemp. When you mix those two together, you get a very, very sticky mix and you can almost put neat bait into it. I would imagine that just one bag of that and a bag of this would mix up with half a gallon or even more of castors and hemp. This finally brings us on to the small packets at the bottom. These are additives, which aren't ground baits in their own right. They just added two ground baits. If you look at the packets, it's clearly indicated on them the species that they are designed to attract. To mix ground bait successfully, it's imperative that you have the right tools to do the job. First of all, you need a good riddle. A maggot riddle is perfect. You want a sponge to add the water, and you want an aerosol spray. This one was from uh, a product for cleaning windows. You can use uh, any garden spray, whatever, but you will definitely need one of these. The first step in mixing ground bait is to pour the dry powders into the ground bait bowl. Now your ground bait bowl needs to be a round bowl without any corners where you can get dry patches or wet patches. Find somewhere fairly flat if you can, lay the bowl on the floor and put your powder in the bowl. For simplicity I'm just going to mix up some of this bobnud feeder. Now, if you're going to mix two different powders together, for instance, Super Cup and Special, this would be the time to mix them. You would pour both powders into the bowl. These would have to be mixed thoroughly whilst they're still dry. It doesn't matter what this mix is we're making here, from here on in, everything is the same. We can imagine this is a mixture of, of cows and pigs if you want, but however you do it, they've got to be mixed dry. Thoroughly mix all the constituents of the bags together dry. The secret of good mixing is not to over wet the ground bait. You have to add the water very carefully and to do this use a sponge. Load the sponge with water and dribble the water onto the ground bait. This allows you to control the amount of water entering the ground bait and you can slowly work the ground bait so that there are no wet areas or dry patches. The secret is in the mix. It's a little bit like baking a cake. Keep working at it and working at it and don't forget the most vital ingredient in this ground bait. You've got to put plenty of air in if you intend to have a fluffy mix. It's a bit like Mr. Kipling's ground bait, this. Be careful not to overwet it at this stage. Get it a little bit dry if necessary rather than wet. That's now starting to mix together very nicely. Right, this ground bait now is starting to come together. It's nice and damp, but not over wetted. And this is where the riddle comes in. We then load the riddle and shape the ground bait through it, back into the bowl. Those lumps you can see there are areas of the ground bait that have absorbed more water than anywhere else. Simply rub those 
across the riddle and they will break down and go back in. There's nothing wasted when you do this, but you will see already, just with that first bit through the riddle, how that has fluffed up. That would enable you to make a ball if you wished, and it would then break down back to crumb. You can always tell a good ground bait if you can make a ball and then break it down without any lumps. If you put this ground bait through the riddle a couple of times, you will then have a perfect mix. Now, this is still a fairly dry mix, and it's an ideal time to separate part of the mix out and put it to one side for using in a ground bait feeder. You don't want a damp mix in a ground bait feeder, you want a fairly dry one that will burst out. What you find then is the remainder of the mix wants damping down again. You can do this in two ways. If it doesn't want too much water, you can use the aerosol sprayer and gradually damp it down. Keep working it in. The other way is to use the sponge. But the problem with adding water at this stage from the sponge is you're likely to get some more lumps in it. That'll mean having to riddle it again. So it's better, if you can get away with it, just to use the sprayer. And this will nicely damp it down for putting balls of ground bait in. That's now gained water evenly and you could catapult that ball of ground bait as far as you could, your catapult would throw it. That would never break up, but even so, if you put it in your hands, rub it down, it'll still rub back down to a perfect ground bait mix. Hey, that was great, Bob. Anyway, are there any um, final tips to pass on? Yes, Matt. It's not the type of ground bait you use, it's the rules of mixing. It's having the right equipment and putting it together correctly. Just follow the simple rules and you won't go wrong. That's interesting because I use the range of census ground baits and I've got to say I'm happy with them. Yeah, you will find that in all these ground baits that the, the, the range is mimicked. Well, there's a cloud range in the census range, there's a cloud range in the Mondial, there's various different companies like Image, Car and Borley, all making ground baits and they all make you a cloud ground bait. It's finding out which is the cloud, which is the heavy mix, which is the sweet mix, and if you just work your way through those mixers, speak to your tackle dealer, you'll find the mix that suits you. OK, moving on now. If there's one area of the sport where ground bait is used very infrequently, it's pike fishing. Having said that, I occasionally use ground bait to attract small fish into my swim, which in turn attracts the pike. But anyway, I'm no expert, but I know a man who is. Former record holder, Neville Fickling. One of the most obvious and neglected aspects of pike fishing is the simple act of casting out. To put it, put it simply, the aim of casting out when you're pike fishing is to get the bait to where you want it without it coming off the hooks, which is the problem particularly when you're live baiting. And there's various ways of uh, making it easier not to lose your bait when you're casting, but the most fundamental thing is to actually don't cast any ink that you've got on harder than, than what it will withstand. And then there's people who are fishing at long distances, you require perhaps a little bit more technique. I mean, I'm not the world's greatest caster, and I don't, I don't profess to be, but I can usually get the baits to, to work to where I want them. And this is only a very, very small bait here, but the key to when you're fishing small baits is, is you use plenty of lead, plenty of weight. And all you do then, as you know, roughly where you're going to cast, which is we're going to aim for about 40 yards out there. You took the bar arm off. And if you're going to do a modest cast, all you do is you, is you push forward with that hand and, and just hold the, the butt. If you're going for real distance, right, and you're trying to, to, to do a long distance cast, you'll start a bit further back uh, out of camera and you'll push really hard down on this and push forward with this. So this small bait is just going to go about 40 yards out there. My favourite dead bait of all uh, has always been the, been the, been the smelt. Uh, 
the simple reason is it's probably the most effective of the pike baits. It's got a lot going for it. Uh, I believe that uh, in nature, pike recognise the smelt as being uh, a very easily available food source, simply because in many waters, particularly rivers and waters connected to rivers, smelt run upstream during the spring to spawn, and many of them die and are very easy to, to, to pick up for pike. I, I believe it's instinctive, so that a, a pike can actually uh, follow this behaviour pattern, regardless of whether the water's connected to the river or not. It's something that's uh, been passed on for millions of years. The big advantage of the smelt is that uh, it's they're generally a very, a very nice size. I mean, these, these are good ones, about two ounces, uh, two and a half ounces a piece, which means you've got plenty of casting weight. And uh, you can pull out, you pull, pull the hooks out of the, the bait quite easily into the pike. Another, <coughs> another bait uh, that is universal in, in use is the mackerel. I mean, these, these, these are lovely little small ones. It's a little bit difficult, the, uh, the, the small mackerel thing, because uh, these aren't intentionally caught. These are generally a byproduct of fishing for, for larger mackerel. Uh, you don't need them this, this small. I generally use larger ones, which, uh, it, which are in half baits. I've got, I've got one here, uh, if we can find it. And that's about the usual size that, uh, that I actually use. And uh, I, I simply cut it in half. I mean, cutting it in half is not exactly a, a technical job. And one mackerel like that makes two baits. Nothing wrong with the heads at all. You catch just as many on the heads as you do the tails. The hooks are mounted. One in the tail root here to take the force of the casting. Both of these are size 8 semi barbers treble hooks and the other one is you can put it anywhere you like in the flank or anywhere like this. And the thing is when a pike takes that uh, within 5 to 10 seconds of getting to the rod you should, if you strike properly, hook the pike without any trouble. Hold on. Yeah, we're, we're away. A lion blowing everywhere in this wind. This one's on a smelt. Bend in. It's come up on the top and is having a bit of a swirl about. It's getting very dark now. I mean, it's only it's only quarter to one, but it's very, very dark now. When they shake the heads like this, they've often got the hooks right on the edge of the mouths. I mean, if it was a big fish, we'd obviously be going very, very carefully. You ought to, wait, ought to wait until they calm down a bit. You only do this normally when the hooks are outside the mouth and if you've got confidence and you're not uh, you're not scared of scared of the actual pipe. Now this one is actually taking the bait down a little bit further than than what you'd uh, you'd want. I'm just going to show you how easy it is to actually take take the take the hooks out. If you if you look there, that one hook is inside the mouth and one is at the top of the gut, right? Well, these are semi barbers treble hooks. And if we go in here through the gill cover and we grab hold of the hook like that and just turn it upside down, and that's it. Very easy. Just take that because it's just lodged just there. Right, and that's it. Out the hooks come. Easy. That 
last sequence makes it look so simple. A big pike as easy to catch as that. Well, they are if you're Neville Fickling. It really is simple, but let's take a closer look at that rig. And here it is split down into its two basic component parts. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the poly ball sliding between two beads and two stop knots. At the top of the screen, you can see the wire trace, and we've substituted two swan shot for the sliding bullet, which Neville favours. Very simple, very effective. As a final plea for me, if you're going to go pike fishing, always make sure you use a wire trace. Never use a gag, because they're brutal and belong in the dark ages. And if you're unsure about handling big pike, go along with someone who's experienced and let them show you the ropes. Anyway, that's enough about pike. Now, I hear a rumour, Bob, that uh, some unlucky young man recently won a weekend's fishing trip out with you. Is this right? That's true. We ran a competition in the Angling Times and young Martin Owens from Merseyside came and joined me for a day on the bank. What was second prize, Bob? Two days on the bank? Certainly was, Matt. With you. The winner was 11 years old Martin Owen from Merseyside. I took him to Lindholm Fisheries, which lies midway between Doncaster and Scunthorpe, just off the motorway. This day ticket fishery is best known for its tench, pike and trout fishing. But we headed for the small carp lake, which I felt certain would come up trumps for him. Martin had only ever caught small fish in the past, so this lake was almost certain to give him his biggest ever fish. Before we started, I had a few surprises for Martin. Sandra Halcon Hunt had made him a Team Daiwa coat, plus a polo shirt and hat. Daiwa Sports had also sent a parcel of goodies, and Tom Pickering had given me an autographed copy of his poll book. As you can see, Martin was over the moon, particularly as he had no idea about the presents. All I had to do now was show him how to catch a few carp. With the youngsters, it pays to keep the tactics simple, so I set up two rods, knowing that one or other should produce a result. The first was a light haven rod using anchored crust. The anchored crust rig is a very simple rig. I'm using a size 4 specimen hook, which is tied direct to the end of the main line, which is £4 line. Two feet above this is a split shot, which acts as a stop shot, and running free above this on the line is an Alzi bomb. If there were any big carp in here, I would have to step up the main line to probably £8 line or £10 line, even stronger depending on how many snags there were. In this instance, the fish don't run above six pounds and it's fairly open water, so four pounds breaking strain line will be quite adequate. On this rig, I will either fish a dog biscuit, which completely masks the size four hook, vanishes inside a dog biscuit, and that will then swell up when it's in the water, or I will use a piece of crust out of a fresh loaf. There are two ways to hook crust, and it depends which sort of a rig you're using as to how you hook it. If I was using a float controller and allowing the line to lay on top of the surface, I would hook the crust through the top. That would keep the line above the water because crust will always float on the water with the cook side, the browned off side, upwards. However, because we've got a bomb on the bottom here and our line is going to be sunk and coming upwards, then it's important to hook the crust through the fluffy bread side, pull it through turn it round, pull it down, and there the hook is inside. As you can see there, even with a relatively small piece of bread, a size to the four hook vanishes. Very often if I'm carp fishing with floating crust, I will go up to a size two or even bigger if there are big fish and snags about. They'll never see that hook inside that crust. I'm using this size four because even for these fish I think it's a little bit on the big size but if I use a hook any smaller I will not connect with the bites. The rig on the other rod is very simple too. I'm using a homemade peacock insert waggler which carries approximately four BB shot. The depth is set at perhaps two and a half feet, maybe a little more. The actual water depth is only 18 inches, in places it's less than that. 
The only shot I've got on the line below the float is this one number eight shot, which is nine inches from the hook. That shot is not there to register on the float, it is there to lay on the bottom and make sure the line lays on the bottom. The problem with carp is that they're very vigorous feeders. When they're feeding, the fins and the tails are wafting about and you get a lot of false bites. By having that shot on the bottom, it will give you nine inches of line out of the way so that when a fish picks up the bait, it is likely to pick up the bait and give you a positive bite. Any false bites you get will come from fish that are actually against the float. The hook is a size 12. This will allow me to use sweet corn in singles or multiples and also maggots. If I have to use these mini boilies, then I will have to increase the size of the hook. The hook is tied direct once again to the main line, and the main line in this case is 2.6 pounds breaking strain. On heavily fish carp waters, the fish soon get tired of sweet corn. They treat it with caution. This caution can be overcome by changing the colour and changing the flavour of the bait. This is done quite easily by using any one of a number of liquid flavours. Today, I added a small amount of vegetable powder. It's, it's a vegetable food dye used in the food industry. It's very cheap. You can get it from any tackle shop. And then to this, I put five millilitres of strawberry neuter fruit. Simply measure a cap full out and add it to the bait. The next step is just put the lid on the bait and give it a good old shape round. The bait goes a very nice shade of, of orange and red and it smells delightful, absolutely delightful. It wasn't long before Martin was into his first fish on the floating crust. A common of perhaps four pounds. This was followed immediately by a mirror, which led him a merry dance. Martin caught fish on and off all day, but it was inevitable that sooner or later one was going to get snagged in the weeds. And sure enough, his ninth fish did. This left me no alternative but to wade out and rescue the fish. It turned out to be a super little ghost carp, a nice bonus to end the day with. Do you want a photo of him with it? Uh, yeah. Up a little bit, so, so the fish in the face are... Oh, well, Martin, I'm afraid we've got to call it a day now. Tell them what you thought of it. Brilliant! All joking apart, Bob, the lad obviously enjoyed himself, did you? Yeah, it's great to work with the youngsters. And Martin proved a super pupil. And to prove it, he caught nine carp, his best day ever. Well, I'm sure he'd welcome the opportunity to do what comes next one day. Imagine you're in the Volga Delta, in a boat, your multiplier reel clicks a couple of times. Is that the same as young one? The moment of truth. Kevin Maddox bends into an unseen catfish. Is it 10 pounds or is it 100 pounds? At this stage of the fight, Kevin's got no way of knowing. His boat partner, Alex, cranks frantically on the anchor. It's important that this isn't in the water so as to foul the fish.
At this stage of the fight, Kevin realises he's hooked one of the giants. His boat partner, Alex, cranks frantically on the anchor to remove it from the water for fear that it will foul the line and cause it to break. Anxious glances from Kevin. The anchor's now in the boat and the couple set off down river in pursuit of the catfish. At this stage of the fight, we're not quite sure whether Kevin is playing the catfish or whether the catfish is playing Kevin. These are strong rods, four pounds test curve. And yet look at that bend. And at this stage, Kevin's barely moved the fish. An anxious moment as the cat comes under the boat. The rod locked hard over, Kevin has no option but to hang on and hope. Almost an hour later, as the sun begins to set, the catfish breaks surface, heart attack time. Look at that tail. And then disaster, a bird's nest as the multiplier reel overruns. Kevin knows he's got to bank this fish very quickly now. He has no option. To allow the fight to continue will mean almost certain disaster. The boat up against the reeds, Kevin pulls very hard to try and get the catfish to the top and under the gaff. Gaffs are no longer used in this country because we don't fish for fish this big. However, catfish have got a soft membrane underneath the jaw and the gaff is the only acceptable method of boating a 100 pound plus fish. Absolute jubilation, exhilaration and exhaustion. He's done it. Over 100 pounds of catfish ready to be swung into the boat well. Well done Kevin. And look at that. Would you fancy putting your hand in there? I know I wouldn't. And it's a two-man job to bring the magnificent creature, watched by some German anglers, into the boat. Oh yes, he knows he's done it now. And there's the proof. Over a hundred pounds of fighting catfish. Well, that makes whip fishing look a bit sick, eh, Bob? Well, it does, Matt, but somebody's got to catch the live bait. You're right, but I tell you what, I'm not sure I'd fancy sharing a boat with that ugly brute. I wouldn't dare call Kevin an ugly brute. I meant the fish, Bob. Oh. Anyway, listen, that's all we've got time for. Say goodbye, Bob. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, that was Angling Times video zine number one. Look out for number two coming soon.